flight controllers should I buy? And and we are spoiled for choice with flight controllers these days. There are so many good flight controllers out there uh, to run clean flight on, which uh, which is my preference for the uh, flight controller firmware to run clean flight or or beta flight specifically. Uh, I think it is currently the best one for uh, for acro flight. Uh, I know that not everyone agrees with me on that, so now I've sparked a great debate. But anyway, it's certainly a very, very popular one, if not the, the most popular. So that's the one I'm going to talk about. So let's talk about flight controllers that uh, run clean flight and what should go into your decision as to which one you would like to buy. And at the end, I'll tell you which is the best one that everyone should buy. Just, no, no, <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> You'll have to decide for yourself, but hopefully I'll give you the information. Uh, I am going to be presenting this information in the time-honored format of a bunch of blank PowerPoint slides with words on them, because on this channel you get information and not production values. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, there are a couple flight controllers I will not be covering, even though they run clean flight. And instead of reading you these slides, I'm going to leave them on the screen for a minute, and you can pause the video and read about why I'm not going to cover them. I think it's all here in the text, and you can pause and read it if you care or if you wonder. Here's the first slide, and here's the second slide. And you can pause now, and you can read all this if you want to, or you can just keep listening, and I'm going to go on. You ready? Here we go. Nays 32 Rev 5. Uh, it's been around for a long time. I still run it on... I still like it. I think it stands very well the test of time. It is cheap. It is reliable. It's been around forever. It still does quite a lot of what we need. Thanks to Boris for extending its life by doing things like I2C bus overclocking and other finding ways to squeeze more performance out of this chip after. You may remember, remember back when we didn't used to be able to run loop times faster than about 1300? And now this chip can get down to sub 500 loop time. And I don't know, it is like it's just magic. So good for Boris. This chip is cheap and uh, has decent performance. Uh, it has, it's also popular enough that some peripherals, like the OS Doge, are designed to integrate with this layout, just stack right on top of it. Uh, what's, what's not to like about it is it doesn't have SBUS inversion, so you have to mod your receiver or use an inverter cable if you want to do FreeSky SBUS. And I have another video on my channel about why SBUS is preferable to CPPM. Um, so it's not the end of the world to get an inverter cable, but it's, it's a little bit clunky. Um, it's a little tricky or impossible to get SmartPort telemetry running. So if you have FreeSky and you want to do SmartPort, you may not be able to on this board. One of the big disadvantages is that it only has two hardware UARTs. And one is tied to the USB. So if you want to do SBUS plus black box, you're using all your UARTs. And as soon as you arm the copter, black box takes over and you can't use the configurator GUI anymore or your, or your Bluetooth adapter if you've got one of those. So it's really lacking in the communications department. On some of the newer boards, you can do SBUS, black box, GPS, OSD, USB, all at the same time. They have way more UARTs. Okay, so um, finally, the F1 chip is slow. It can max out at 1 kilohertz gyro sync with the accelerometer enabled. And if you were using a processor intensive features like soft serial and LED strip, uh, they may force you to run at a higher loop time than that. That being said, one kilohertz gyro sync with beta flight and all the features that it has for, for enhanced flight performance is amazing. So then you go, well, is two kilohertz going to be even more amazing? Maybe, maybe. All I'm saying is if you have the NACE 32s, don't throw them out. And if everybody else is out of stock or you don't want to wait for, you know, th three weeks shipping from China and you can find an ACE32 locally, just use it. It's fine. It's fine. It's the old standby. Um, what about the, uh, so here's a photo of the board right here. One of the things about the NACE32 that is a little controversial is that it has these edge launch pads here for sideways facing uh, pins. Some people don't like that. Some people solder directly to them. That's up to you whether you like that or whether you don't like that, but it certainly is a thing, okay? Now, let's take a look. The next one is the Nase 32 Rev 6. This is an update to the Rev 32. One of the things that TimeCop did when he designed this was he put an SBUS inverter in. Uh, unfortunately, though, the SBUS inverter is, it's just a piece of hardware. It's like an inverter cable that you bought uh, and, and used, but instead the inverter is just directly wired on the board. 
compare that to the, the uh, UARTs in the F3 boards that have software configurable inversions, so you can have inversion or not as you need it. Here, you've got SBUS inverter hardwired in, um, and, and that doesn't give you as many options and as much flexibility. So eh, it's, not, it's not the worst, but it could be better. Uh, it has a barometer added for altitude control. I guess that's nice, but a lot of the F3 boards have a barometer built in, and I don't even talk about that. I'm not even going to talk about that because, like, I think uh, many of the clean flight pilots are focused on acro flight. I know that there's some work being done on the iNav update to make the GPS navigation in clean flight much, much better, and I think that's going to be a very exciting thing when it finally gets merged. But for the time being, I think most people are flying clean flight in acro mode and they're not using things like compass or barometer. I know you guys are out there. I don't mean to disparage you. I know you're out there. But that's just not where most of the focus is. So some of these boards have a barometer. Big deal. Good for them. Clean flight's altitude hold is honestly not that good, even, even with the barometer. So anyway, I'm not going to mention that anymore, but it does have a barometer. The Rev6 adds a 16 megabit. That's megabits, not megabytes. Divide by 8, 2 megabytes, data flash chip on board for black box logging, so that's nice. You're not going to get a lot of data in 16 megabits, but you'll get, you'll get a minute or two maybe, maybe a little more. Um, it uses the MPU 6500 gyro, which has worse noise specifications than the MPU 6050 on the Rev5. I'll talk a little bit more at the end of the presentation about what this actually might mean. But it's got a slightly noisier gyro, which might have an effect or it might not on flight performance. The original release of this board backfed the ESCs from the USB port. What that meant is that as soon as you plugged in USB, the ESCs would power up. And that made it impossible to do throttle calibration because of the ESCs because you got to raise the throttle and then power up the ESCs. Well, the ESCs are powered up as soon as the flight controller is plugged in. So that was annoying for some people. Uh, it also meant that potentially you could even try to spin your motors from the USB port. I don't think you would spin them very hard because most USB ports are current limited to uh, maybe, maybe 2 amps at most, 500 milliamps more typically, but uh, they, they, they would try to do it. Uh, finally, the Rev6 is not pin compatible with the Rev5, so peripherals like OS Doge won't work. And here's a photo of the NACE 32 Rev6. Notice that one of the things that's different about this board is that the RC input header no longer uh, is edge launch. Now it's regular through hole. Some people will prefer that. Some people like the edge launch maybe better. I don't know. Um, everything else is pretty much the same though. Uh, we can see here they're labeled. Notice that they're also silkscreen labeled. Uh, these ones uh, with the with the whether it's a UART or whether it's LED or whatever, so that's nice. Everything silk screen labeled on the back. So the the MPU sixty five hundred that TimeCop used in the Nace thirty two Rev six has worse noise than the sixty fifty that's used in the Rev five, but the MPU sixty five hundred supports SPI and SPI is is better than I two C in some respects. Okay, so, so that, that seems to me like the big motivation for going with the MPU 6500 is that you want to use SPI. So TimeCop uses the MPU 6500, but the NACE32 Rev6 still uses I2C. So it's kind of weird to me. If you wanted SPI, why not use the MPU 6000, which, is a, which is, uh, has the same noise spec as the 6050 and also supports SPI? But if you wanted, I, if you were just going to use I two C anyway, why not stick with the MPU sixty fifty, which has a better noise spec? Why time cop? Why go watch this video if you don't get that reference? <laughs> why it doesn't make it's kind of a confusing decision to me, and I don't understand it. Anyway, whatever. There are a bunch of Nays thirty two clones. They have slightly different board layouts, but uh, they basically run, they're underneath. They're the same. Um, so there's the Dragonfly 32. It's a clone of the Nace 32. It has basically the same pros and cons. It has through-hole pins for all headers, so there's no edge launch. And it has a full three-row header for RC inputs, for the RC input section. So if we look over here, uh, here, here is the RC input section. Yes, I believe that's true. Um, it's either this one or this one. I believe it's this one. And we can see that there's a full three-row header here instead of just the signal pins. And what that means is that if you have got a peripheral like a Bluetooth adapter or, or, or anything that needs, um, that needs power, it's going to be easier to get the power here. You could put, you could, if you so felt, if you so desired, 
put a three row header here and have an extra set of five volt and ground pins to pull power from for things like when i've hooked up my open tx logger for black box i've got signal on uart2 right so signal is over here wherever but then i have to find somewhere else to get power and ground from so i have to go all the way over to the motor header to get power and ground well that's a little bit annoying it would be nice to have just a three row header here that uh that i could plug right into on the other hand you might say man that three row header takes up extra room and i'm never going to use it but hey you can always just not install those pins if you don't want to if you look right here very carefully you can see that this person has only installed the signal pins has only installed one row so it's nice and flat here so the extra the extra ground and power lines are there if you want them and if you don't want them just uh you know don't install those pins no problem uh the oh hang on also the uart2 uh header layout if we look over here this is the uart output and the uart has five volt ground transmit and receive uh, which is better than the nace 32 layout the nace 32 layout takes the transmit and receive pins and puts them somewhere but then you just have to go find five volts and ground maybe from the motor header maybe wherever so this one breaks them out so you can have just a four pin header for your for your uart2 peripheral that just plugs straight in and that's that's nice that's convenient it makes for a cleaner cleaner build um the next one is the Massive Acro Black Box. I had not actually heard of this one before I uh, emailed Massive RC to ask them. I just emailed the major manufacturers to see if they had any input on the information I've got here. And, uh, and he emailed me back and pointed this one out to me. Here's what it looks like. It is, uh, it is very similar to a NACE32. It may, you might even call it a, a NACE32 clone. I think that, that, that is true. Uh, it adds a 64 meg data flash chip for black box logging. That's a pretty big chip. Uh, it has the same pin layout as NACE32, so it is compatible with NACE32 specific peripherals like the OS Doge. It adds a full three row header for RC input, same as the Dragonfly, so no edge launch pins. And the Rev2 board has a 5 volt regulator built in. That's pretty cool. So you can run opto ESCs with no BEC, but then where are you going to get 5 volts from for your, for your uh, flight controller and other 5 volt devices? The answer is that you just run your 2 to 6S battery directly into this board and then you've got five volts on the motor header and the rc pins if you like and you can just pull that out to wherever you need it so that's cool so this is pretty nice uh com compared to the naze rev 5 i think i like the rc uh, header layout better i love the fact that it's got a built-in voltage regulator that's great and it's uh personally i prefer to log to an open log device not to black box but it is nice that it's got that on board as well for people who want to use that. And then we come to the CC3D. And the CC3D had so much potential to be, it's, it, it's, it has an SPI gyro on it, which, which is faster than I2C. With I2C gyro, you can run up to 2 kilohertz. With uh, SPI, about 2 kilohertz. With SPI, you can run up to the full 8 kilohertz that the gyro is capable of. And, and if you don't want to get into all the details, the short version is that more kilohertz is potentially better. But there's so many other janky things about the CC3D. Uh, so it comes with the Open Pilot bootloader. So if you want to run Open Pilot, great. No problem. Done. Everything is wonderful. But if you want to run Clean Flight, then either you have to take features out of clean flight like G tuner or and you, they they take out features that no, that are seldom used like G tune or the LED screen feature but they have to free up memory so there has to be this special version uh, just for clean flight with the bootloader but then you can uninstall the clean flight bootloader and you can have all the memory and then you can run regular versions with all the features uh, but then you can't flash new firmware over USB anymore you have to use an FTDI adapter and it can do BL Heli pass through, but you also got to use an FTDI adapter there. And it's just, and then it, it doesn't have uh, battery voltage monitoring, but you can get a custom hex that has battery voltage monitoring on one of the other pins, and yada yada yada. And it's just a bunch of nonsense and kind of annoying to me. And this board really seems attractive because there's there's it's well designed and it it has uh, it uses the virtual COM port, which means you get an additional UART. Uh, compared to the nases, this board has three usable UARTs, whereas the uh, maybe it has four. I think it's three, whereas the um, the the nases only have two. 
but it's just so much other junk about it that, that it kind of gives it me a bad taste in my mouth, and I, I kind of don't like it. I know some people are big fans of this board. Um, one of the things about this board that also stands out is that it has micro JST connectors for the RC header and for the UARTs. Now, some people like these and some people don't, and I'm not going to tell you which you should, whether you should like them or whether you shouldn't. That's up to you. Uh, some people prefer the, the through-hole pins because they're easier to work with. Some people like the micro JST because they're smaller and flatter. It's up to you whether that's a pro or a con. You'll notice I didn't put that in the good or the bad side. That's completely up to you, but it does have that. And that is the end of the F1 boards. Which of these boards is the best? Which one should you buy? Well, you buy which one, ever, whatever one you like. I got to tell you, uh, I like the NACE 32 Rev 5. The Rev 6, there's nothing wrong with it. Now that they fixed the backfeeding issue, Rev 6A of the board fixed the backfeeding ESC's issue. So there's nothing wrong with the Rev 6, but I'm not sure it brings a lot to the table either. It's got a worse gyro. It's got the S-Bus inverter. That's kind of good, but I could just use a... I could just use an inverter cable. And the Rev 5 has just been around forever, and you can just go on Banggood or My RC Mart and spend 20 bucks and get one. And now that the Rev 6 is out, you can't really buy the Rev 5 legitimately anymore from US sources. I can't find it. So I kind of feel don't feel guilty about buying a clone from Banggood because, you know, <laughs> I don't want the Rev 6 anyway. I want the Rev 5. And now this the 20 bucks from China is the only place I can find it. So so I'm, I'm uh, free and clear. Um, also, the uh, the massive acro black box is sure sure compelling. You know the Dragonfly thirty two is is nice, um, but I'm not sure it brings like a lot to the table compared to the Nace thirty two Rev five. Uh, it's got a little bit better layout, but you know. But then the massive acro black box has the uh, voltage regulator on board has a pretty big data flash chip and it's, you know, and it's pin compatible with an ACE32 uh, peripheral. So uh, I think between these two, either the Massive Acro Black Box V2 or the NACE32 Rev5 would be my choice. Um, but any of them are good. The only one I kind of don't like is the NACE32 Rev6. And I think a lot of that is just because when it first came out, it backfed the ESCs. And I was so irritated about that that now it's just put a bad taste in my mouth and I don't want anything to do with it. Now that that's been fixed, it's probably fine too. Anyway, that's the F1 boards and I'm now uh, 18 minutes into this video. So I'm going to stop this video here and I'm going to do the F3 boards in a separate video. See you then.